Lecture 5, Working Without Knowing. This, like the third one, will be read. The difficulties of grasping perspectives, of finding analgesics for confronting the painful, the exquisite needs for tact, timing, and feeling are matched by the difficulties of working without knowing. Professionals are supposed to know. Faced by desperate people, they want to know. Yet we confront the unique and often unknowable. Descriptive psychiatry presents diseases we can recognize. Psychoanalysis provides a seemingly clear map of unconscious processes. These are templates we use to give form to the work, hence part of the ferocity of sectarian disputes. My template lets me feel I know. It is the same reason may, people may need to be in love when they marry. This intoxicating state makes us feel certain. How many would enter such a prolonged, demanding commitment without the assurance of overwhelming feelings? We also fall in love with disease pictures and maps of the unconscious and all those other images put in place of an uncertain reality. On the other hand, to seek perspectives and the changing of perspectives is more than a starting confession of ignorance. It says to the patients, you feel you know you're stuck. I don't know. This is the first and perhaps most salutary difference in our perspectives. Psychotherapy is an opening up of possibilities born of changing perspectives. Later, the meaning of working without knowing changes. Then the discovery of possibilities may present itself as the discovery of certainty. Discoveries collect to seemingly inexorable conclusions. Individuals collapse into diseases or formulations or the right perspective, useful servants but now in charge. At this point, we need a perspective from which every perspective is only that. At the end, not knowing emerges out of the so-called termination to show a familiar face. Certainly the opening up of possibilities and avoidance of concluding, and perhaps again this, the sometimes shy, sometimes robust acceptance of our singular existence to which we are both entrusted and exposed. Can we make such existences, which we will never fully know and seldom predict, our own? Is there a mature perspective? And what is the place of self-possession? Is it possible to stop or even slow the great rush to conclude? It has been reported that medical diagnoses are made in the first 30 seconds of meeting. I doubt if psychological diagnosing is different. At the opposite extreme, Freud suggested diagnosis should follow treatment, which in many cases is interminable. These two extremes face each other still. Good sense dictates diagnosis should precede treatment. A long, close psychological study reverses that good sense. There is one way in which diagnosis must always precede treatment. As patient and therapist deposit in the space between them feelings and ideas, these shape the responses to them, sometimes toward a diagnosis. The most evenly suspended attention, the most even-headed neutrality, will still be signally affected by what it hopes to transcend. There is no iron box in which to keep feelings and ideas. The most we can hope is that the shaping and affecting results in hypotheses, that is, keeping a perspective on uncertainty about the perspectives being shaped and affected. Similarly, whatever finality, whatever diagnosis or formulation we approach awaits the end of treatment. This is because we have no way of knowing whether that finality was discovered or created whether it lay steady and unchanging all through the treatment until it could at last be fully seen or was growing, perhaps nourished by the treatment itself, into something partly new. Since psychological treatment is an historical and not an experimental process, there is simply no way to know. Diagnostic hypotheses precede a company and follow treatment. I conclude. 
not knowing has to find its way between the hypothetical or tentative on the one hand and our over and over again deciding the inescapability of confident reactions. There is no useful floating above ideas and reactions. We must be informed, animated by both, in essence so that we can err and correct our erring from a changed perspective. It is this expectation of error that is the closest we come to knowing, because to err is to half, half suppose we know or might know. Perspectives grope towards one another. We work in the dark. As in the laboratory, most of the experiments do not work. It is much more likely we will prove ourselves wrong than right. It has been strongly argued we can never prove ourselves right, only wrong. My point is, a lively expectation of error puts us in the frame of mind to look and hear afresh. Such an expectation might seem easier at the start when there is nothing to go on except our prejudices, but this ignores the difficulty at the start of sensing how we have erred. Indeed, what could it mean to err at such a juncture? And the meaning of error that throughout must be different for patient and therapist. I suggest the most obvious meaning of error at the start for therapists is to provoke needless pain. We are not yet positioned to know if we cut into the right or wrong organ. On the other hand, we can learn if the anesthetic works. This pertains to all three elements of what I have called psychological anesthesia. The protection of self-esteem, understanding, and the provision of a future. Philosophers like to say, I think, therefore I am. Every man says, I hurt, therefore I am, and I don't like it. Nevertheless, we do not learn very much by hurting people, except that they are alive. I make this point because it is widely disputed in this pre-anesthetic era of interviewing. Therapists often conclude when the patient says, ouch, now I have reached something important. You hurt, therefore you are sick. One model is palpation of a sick abdomen. Pressing here and there an inflamed appendix, liver, whatever, may be identified. So a review of the patient's history and interests exposes its tender spots. But again, how do we know? Working this way yields often useful suspicions. I believe the danger is in turning suspicions into confident knowledge or paying for the investigation with incurable hostility. What will be necessary in an emergency room or in the management of acute problems need not become a general principle. But the difficulties lie deeper still. Emergency medicine can be bad medicine for a systematic reason. Not only must diagnosis and treatment be rapid, in order for practitioners to work under such conditions, they must develop a speed and accuracy that allows them to feel that they do know. This stands at the opposite pole to any procedure like psychotherapy, which must resist knowing, lest it exclude fresh perspectives as well as opportunities for their development or creation. Where emergency work must close down possibilities in the service of action, psychotherapy needs to open them up in the service of the future. It is as true psychotherapy can be bad medicine for a different systematic reason. Many therapists leave behind history taking and formal examinations when they leave training. Some have not asked a probing question in years, settling into a slow waiting pace, not disturbed even by the present insurance climate. The boldest contend with Sullivan that history, direct history taking produces at best wonderful works of clinical fiction. At worst, misleading complaints and outright lies casting permanent shadows on the work. Yet the worry persists. What are we missing? A brain tumor? Addictions? A rapidly treatable hidden depression? The list is extensive. These are facts we need to know. Early I asked the patient to see an internist or a psychopharmacologist I trust, and these patients, physicians, to tell the patient anything we need to know, much as wise surgeons do before an operation. When this is impossible, I orient myself and listen with ignorance in mind. 
It is often the first moment in any treatment when the paradoxes of psychotherapy make themselves strongly felt. We can know very little. We need to know a great deal. If we press too hard in the direction of knowing, we may learn still less. We need openness to the other, sometimes even credulity, and yet the deepest skepticism. We need passionate concern and utter detachment, the most complete knowledge in a beginner's mind. I believe the difficulties of containing these extremes set our limits to the work and nowhere more sharply than, than at the start. Is it perhaps definitive of the psychological to keep pulling back toward the center from one extremity or the other? As the work deepens, ignorance can appear to lift. Early, earlier I suggested we await the unexpected. At this point, the expected appears. Beloved preconceptions, often painfully learned, collect their data to a real sense of closure. Each era has its favorites. At my beginnings, these were schizophrenia and hysteria. hysteria. Today, they are mania, depression, and borderline states. Once it was hidden fantasies, now it is appalling facts. Once unconscious, now brain processes and diseases. A hundred years ago today, today's favorites were also in fashion. Then even Freud spoke of seductions, abuses, and brain processes. It is the same with clothings, clothing and paintings. The herd mentality overruns observation and individuality. Quantitative studies have the protection of measurement. Lacking this, psychological studies need long memories, lest the historical collection of new observations and techniques be forgotten in the rush from one appealing perspective to the next. Even at the present moment, when a hesitant pluralism emerges, as it did with Meyer in the 20s and 30s, memories seem short. As long as the recognition of internal states and processes, insight is the goal of psychotherapy, subjectivity takes itself as an object to track down and accept, this is what I am, my particular fixations, defenses, self-representations, which can be known. On the other hand, the subjective may be positioned only to inquire how it sees, its outside or particular inscape, its view from within, placed between patient and the world. For example, how therapists are seen in the transference. Fixation, defense, self-representation are then ideas about how this perspective developed. Emphasis shifts from object to angle of vision, every object becoming an apparent object which changes as the perspective changes. And because we are looking at ourselves looking, the angle of refraction is both considerable and successively moved. It is as if we throw shadows, which alter strikingly as our relation to the angle of light alters. So I import, am important in my family, perhaps also in my own heart, but the community hardly knows me, the world not at all. As a result, what importance I attach to myself depends on where I stand. For example, I have noted many grandiose psychotic people are extraordinarily important to their mothers and remain that because they have no larger world. It is the same with desire. Looking forward to a satisfaction, anticipation rises. Then it abruptly falls if we remember that the satisfaction ends. One result is we must wonder what status insights have. A patient dreamt he gnawed on his arm, a child lost in a bleak, featureless landscape. Awake, awake, the patient looked down at the nails he bites, feeling his fear and isolation in a world now rich, even joyous. Often he does not glimpse that new landscape, so preoccupied is he with the dangers to it or its, imposs or its possible disappearance. I see parts of it, he sees it longer through my eyes, Perhaps the dream will fade if he looks steadily at the new world. But I cannot tell the patient he is sick or wrong or still a bitter child. The child may have seen clearly. It is by no means obvious what is the best way to go through this difficult world. Perhaps the patient has built such a changed world just because he knows the facts of starvation and isolation. Indeed, his new world is one of the best I've met, and he guards it zealously aware that a bleak world could return. He tells me his children enjoy life more than he does. 
For a moment he sees life through their eyes too. I say, honor that wise, hungry child as well as what he has built. I do not sense we know. Perhaps, as Freud wrote, the child gnawed because he had a strong oral drive and will never be satisfied. There are no measurements. It is only a hypothesis we pursue, which is a form of fiction, itself one of the early synonyms for hypothesis. We live within fictions, therapists no less. This is what I have meant by perspectives being the stuff of psychotherapy. The central issue remains, how do we deal with each other's fictions? Respectfully, yes. Patiently, yes. No doubt the other's fictions acknowledge facts. Mine do not. I would be wise to ferret out those facts, even let them reshape my fictions. I see what you mean, we say at such moment. I see what has shaped your perspective and may reshape mine. Consider each other's landscapes, the views from our rooms. Gasquet had Cezanne saying he was something like the landscape's consciousness. The landscape is, Gasquet said, reflected, humanized, thinks itself in me, um, Freud, uh, Cezanne remarked. Therapists do that too, but it is nothing more than what we mean by experience. Cezanne was special only in demanding the landscape work on him, express its fullness through him. He wanted the mountains, the apples, least successfully the figures, to move through him toward the canvas on their own. All he could give of his own life was, of his own, was the life, the vitality, the separateness he experienced. Cezanne's world would not be the same landscape. Another patient presented the same scene, even though both wanted to be merely the landscape's consciousness. So I cannot see as the patient sees. The patient should not even want me to at least for long, because he or she needs another view. It should be enough I let the person be and present my own as only another fiction. Yet some fictions appear more lifelike than others, as some paintings do. The others repeat formulas for experience, stereotypes, clichés. Then we do not feel the writer or the artist. There is no fresh perspective. In the same vein, patients can seem walking clichés with immediately recognizable viewpoints. Can they be the patient's own? Perhaps. We don't want to make a fetish of the avant-garde. More important, the conventional garb is safe. Many buoyant spirits wear it to move freely. But that means there is a separate, hidden perspective. Marriage often begins with both parties taking a conventional perspective on one another. They are in love, adoring, perfect giving. Lucky people rescue from that near psychosis love, in which distinct perspectives are expressed, lived with, enjoyed. The two deal successfully with and change each other's fictions. Thereby, marriage gains binocular vision, each party having available two perspectives and the interaction of those two perspectives. Much can be seen from many angles. Successful marriage thus provides a fresh occasion to note features of health in what is central to this study of perspectives in psychotherapy, the way perspectives gain from one another. In the last lecture, I made a gathering sense of the patient's strengths, one of the first orders of treatment business. We need to discern how much there is to do, how much the patient can be trusted to make it alone, how active to be. I spoke of a robust presence, or a fake or pallid almost absence. I suggested that this dim sense could be aided by signs of reflectiveness, especially self-corrections, one part of the patient's perspective toning down or correcting what was said moments before. This inner dialogue depends on a basic harmony, a tolerance, which can withstand even fierce disputes. Note again the likeness to successful marriage. Fights are almost welcome when they expose the basic respect. There is also a parallel to individual self-possession. We recognize self-possession in the presence of dialogue. When I say that I am the equal of my conscience, I mean I can hear what it says and still talk back to it. It is mine. I am not its. Self-possession is suggested as well by imaginative freedom. I am not afraid to let my mind run free. I will not lose it 
as an associative or psychotic state when running free, I even come back refreshed. So loving partners are free to imagine complete escape, divorce, even death. They are not prisoners of each other. I often quote Nietzsche's, it was only by the thought of suicide that I got through many a dark night. I also mentioned the capacity for both connection and disconnection as, sign of, as signs of health. We need to reach each other and leave each other. Everyone knows relationships destroyed by one party's terror of leaving or being left. The psychological suffocation that comes from a shriveling of perspective, often for both parties, results from this. Often, a narrowing of outlook that says, you must. The worst outcomes are not separation or divorce, but that petrifying closeness, almost immobility, one sees in many long marriages. Of course the failures of connection are as great and frequent as these failures of disconnection. Many have barely connected before they must disconnect. You can see them touching and running. Dealing with each other's fictions in long relationships is like passing through a foreign country, sometimes welcomed, sometimes scorned, many times left stranded in a solitary place with mumbling strangers, all there is for guides. Psychotherapy is easier because there are not so many points of contact in either space or time, more chances for getting away to reflect, less dependence, fewer invasive relatives, the list is long. But marriage has an advantage that psychotherapy would do well to annex. Marriage often takes, between, takes place between consenting, even well-acquainted adults. Psychotherapists, too, should let the work develop slowly, as I have suggested, not imposing early some plan or structure, lest the two parties found out late they are ill-suited to each other. Again, it is a case of not knowing, of accepting we do not know each other and must let our respective feelings form or refuse the possibility of a deeper connection. I dreamt I could not find my car. I thought the garage had lost it, but it was found in the garage. They wanted to fix it. I haggled with them over the price, then did not want to pay the bill. I awoke disgruntled and could not grasp the dream until I sensed how accurately it portrayed much of my outlook on life. I often feel important things will be lost. I sense events beyond my control and I get furious. I came by the perspective honestly. There was considerable mystery early in my life. Where was my father? A similar question arose in my first marriage, my wife forming and hiding a relationship with a neighbor. I believe this lost, suspicious, angry perspective is deeply etched on my nervous system. Given a hint, I can see it almost anywhere. And the Oedipal themes. Was I sensing the dangers of rivalry, the threatened and threatening father, the age-old facts of male competition, or my own threats? In this reading, dreams are the brain's perspectives, its habitual expectations, and what it is used to assembling for materials inside and around it. I make this point because the outlooks we bring to our relationships have the definiteness, the stubbornness of something etched, whether we speak of brain or unconscious formations, so the change must be difficult and slow. And because perspectives are formed between brain and world, Brain affects world and the world brain. The patient's worlds must change as much as the brains change if the old perspectives are not to reappear. We cannot ask ourselves to believe in the reality of a new world, no more than in the reality of a new perspective until both world and perspective change. My experience is that the inner world lags behind the outer, so patients cannot know either until well after the new outer facts appear. Did I marry my wife because of resemblance to the disappearing father, a fit with my expectations? Or did my expectations shape her behavior? Or are both these merely one more instance of my perspective shaping now my explanations? I don't know. What I learned was I also did not know that perspective. It possessed me rather than my possessing it. Fearful of loss, busy trying to show myself up, I dove into career building perhaps why the wife left. I was not in possession of myself. Perhaps I am better now. I could recognize the perspective in my dream. I don't mean being equal to it, but I can talk back. 
There is even a chance I might serve someone else's ideals in addition to my own. Not knowing in between the beginning and ending periods of treatment is this dealing with each other's fictions. We discover we do not know many of these fictions, how they shape our lives, or what measure of wisdom they contain. Moreover, therapists discover, as do partners in any serious relationship, that what they thought they knew is changed by meeting any fresh perspective. It is also good that our perspective do not change easily or quickly. No doubt if they did, some new Hitler would make us worse slaves than we are. And we could lose the wisdom our viewpoints have. It is only a little movement we want here and there, just a pull on the sheets or a kick at the rudder. The change direction will shift those viewpoints, sometimes toward a clearer outlook, perhaps self-possession. Can we say what we want psychotherapy to produce? Is there an ideal person we should become? Some of the developmentalists suggest so. Many people tell me they want to be able to love those closest to them as well as their work. I've seen that happen, but it's not for everyone, simply because the conditions of life make either love of persons or of work impossible. Is there a mature perspective? Part of such a perspective might be to deny its existence, to give way to a broad relativism and tolerance, upon which, however, any therapeutic effort must put restrictions. This is because people want guidance whether it is to avoid pain and death in either the physical or psychological spheres. Even a thoroughgoing respect for the uniqueness and wisdom of individual perspectives acknowledges that perspectives can include this yearning for guidance, sometimes when it is only a desired movement back toward respect for oneself. Many of, what, many of the features of what seems to me a mature outlook include the very uncertainty about the course of life and our knowledge discuss a readiness to bear anxiety, failure, incompleteness, guilt, death, as well as the joy arising from the senses of capacity and possibility, however incomplete and transient they are. I have suggested, too, a simultaneous uncertainty and commitment, which appears emotionally as both fear and courage, and morally as a sense of guilt for our part in what goes wrong, with knowing guilt to be the inevitable lot of humans who take part in life at all. Whether acceptance of life is shy or robust depends, I suppose, as much on our temperaments as on the extent to which we have taken a measure of what this singular existence of our own can entail. Some are lucky in the sense they pass through a long course of years in a confident acceptance of their existences, though such a course seems less likely today when so many viewpoints challenge each other and the protection once accorded whole strata of society steadily erodes. Is such a readiness, fear, guilt, and commitment what is meant by self-possession, which is another ideal, this time springing from the concept of perspective itself and the psychological capacity of the perspective to take itself as an object? When a perspective includes itself, we speak of self-consciousness, from which emerges the possibility of various attitudes toward the object. I may not admit some part of myself, dissociation, or project it onto others, or simply attack it, self-depreciation, or I may be enslaved to it. Am I the equal of my conscience? Self-possession implies a number of such attitudes and relationships, an acknowledgment of what one contains, which includes an acknowledgment of the contents of being one's own, and the capacity, or at least the attempt, to govern them and take some responsibility we see immediately that such a governance will mean readiness, anxiety, guilt, and commitment. The nature of the psychological dictates that I myself am but one of the innumerable people I can take as an object. None of the possible attitudes toward myself are anything but possible attitudes toward others, including not admitting, projecting, attacking, or enslaving. It is also true that we can possess others which is a generally acceptable state with young children and sometimes with patients if they are thought dangerous to themselves or others. Of course, it occurs in the form of personal tyranny on many other occasions. Psychotherapy falls into this dangerous possibility when it is itself governed by strict notions of how people should be. Note that self-possession is both to possess ourselves and to be possessed. 
that is to have given ourselves to ourselves and because we mingle with those important to us both outwardly and inwardly we give ourselves to each other self-possession depends upon having lived a history in relationship to ourselves and to those important to us a history known by stories and mementos that accumulate to form that history as geological strata do to form a history of the earth this is inevitably a history of battles as well as of peace and it is often the battles which give most color to the story whether our battles with ourselves or others extraordinary people accumulate stories that collect into biography to be written over and over again from changing perspectives while every life that achieves some self-possession is the object of at least family history which also has as many versions as it does perspectives on a smaller and shorter scale these remarks also pertain to psychotherapy of course one often takes a history as the saying is in helping work but one also makes history this is publicly evident, for example, when a biographer includes the work of a psychotherapist. Termination may have as its meaning that patient and therapist no longer take each, take each other as objects of active therapeutic concern, but this by no means implies that each step steps outside each other's history. Some ethicists say once a patient, always a patient in relation to the therapist. But the wisdom in this cannot protect patients from other psychological intrusions that may persist for the rest of their lives. An excessive formality of treatment method may, as an instance, continue in the patient's own behavior, like operating instruments left behind in an abdomen after surgery. Yet the most common exa examples merge imperceptibly with some of the best results of treatment, as in retaining useful, useful vestiges of the therapist's perspective. Again, the fact is we cannot know, can only guess or surmise the result of interventions. For this reason, the experience of ending treatment provides an opportunity to ask again for what I call the pristine call of conscience. Is this for me? Not the crowd lessons of convention or custom or our cherished theories, to, to which hopefully we have become equal, but the closest call of oneself to oneself. The subject and the objective whisper to one another across an almost secret space. In the next lecture, I will try to describe how therapists may encourage such a calling, which must raise the possibility that much in the treatment has been mistaken, a fresh distortion. My point now is, talk of ending offers the possibility of enlarging imaginative freedom for each other on the model of the physical distancing which is about to occur. We cannot predict what, we, what will be done with that freedom, but it may enable a fresh perspective on even the most cherished results of the treatment, lest they contain elements we do, we do not want to make our own. For example, how much is the fear, anger, and guilt we feel neurotic or simply results of the conditions of life? Our being thrown into an existence we only gradually and never completely make our own. The uncertainty of such a making and the inevitable failings to reach toward and achieve what might be. This, or can we ever know? Not knowing has the considerable benefit of rendering us modest in all these efforts, which surely the similarly burdened patients can appreciate. It may avoid as well conflict springing from rendering these human states of fear, anger, and guilt as sick and from efforts to see each other's perspectives in ways lessening rather than enlarging their views of life. Both these benefits of not knowing put therapists in a better position than that provided by any number of interpretations to support the always anxious, guilty resolve to move faithfully in the world.